John chapter 7. If you don't mind taking your Bible out and turn there. Um, I want y'all to help us. Um, you know, I don't, I ain't going to say anything yet. I ain't going to say anything yet. We have, we have an opportunity this coming year. Uh, to work with a, another ministry to host a prophecy conference here. And I'm not going to say a whole lot right now. Um, I'm going to have a talk with our board um, probably this Sunday afternoon if, if everybody uh, can get together and just talk about it. Um, <clears throat> but um, the the... Red River Prophecy Conference that I went to every year, they've pretty much shuttered all of that. Um, they were having a hard time in the last several years with getting enough people to come to afford it. It's a very expensive to rent that big hall that they have up there. And um, uh, there's a little known thing that we did uh, every year for that conference. I didn't say anything while we were doing it, but um, they, they were, as part of me speaking up there, they were supposed to pay for our flight up there and back and everything like that. And um, so at the last several years, we started contributing that to the conference. We wouldn't let them pay for our air, airfare. And that was our way of supporting the conference. Well, when COVID hit, they went. The, it, it hit so suddenly. They already had the speakers lined up, and we were about ready to go. And, and then they just canceled everything. And so we did the online conference. And then that was in 2020. And of course, this year they didn't do anything. And um, so the I haven't heard an official word, but I, I've heard they've taken the website down, and so anyway, we won't, I don't think we'll be going up there again anytime soon, but there is another ministry that, um, as far as I know, I personally don't have a problem working with them, but we're going to look into it and pray about it and, and see if it's just a right fit for our church, and um, to host uh, one of these prophecy conferences, and we'll just go from there. But just kind of help us pray about that, you folks here at Bethel and you folks online. Of course, anything we do here, we would put online. And uh, so we, you know, we just ask you to help us pray about it as a church. Does, is this what God wants for us? And so on. And um, so just help us pray about that, all right? Well, we had a pretty day yesterday. Brother Roy, and um, we gave Bonnie our last goodbyes yesterday, and uh, it was sort of bittersweet in that it was in the same pavilion that we laid Brother Wayne to rest, and uh, that brought back, um, I'm, I, I'm going to say good memories, because I was very, very touched. Um, with the, uh, the, that young Marine just blessed me at Brother Wayne's uh, gravesite ceremony, the way he knelt down on both knees in front of Jan and handed her that flag. And he said, on behalf of the president, and he wasn't talking about Brandon either. Yeah. He said, on behalf of the president of the United States, and I, and I just started bawling then. Uh, boy, if Wayne could hear that. But he's got a king now, Amen. So anyway, uh, we gave Bonnie our last goodbyes yesterday and pray for Brother Roy and um, just keep him lifted up in your prayers. And I mentioned yesterday, and this goes to everybody who has lost a loved one, whether it be husband, wife, mom, dad, brother, sister, son, or daughter, is that Bonnie was a good wife to Roy, and um, she understood him, and uh, took pretty good care of him, and Roy tried his best to take good care of Bonnie, and he did, 
And um, so when God, when God says, okay, Bonnie, it's time now, let's go, and Bonnie goes to be with Jesus, well, that doesn't mean that Roy's left alone. He's got someone greater now. One who sticketh closer than a brother. Amen? And um, so those who have lost loved ones, you've, you've lost a loved one, but you've gained something better. Is how I look at it. And if or when my day comes uh, to part with my wife, that's how I want to see it. When that day happens, if that day happens. John chapter 7, I know that it's been a while uh, since we've gone over this on a Wednesday night. Uh, we was doing some traveling there and, and then thank him and holidays and so on. But I want to I go back over this very quickly and uh, talk about the Feast of Tabernacle just for a few minutes. And then we'll kind of roll on out throughout the chapter. Uh, John chapter 7 verse 1, after these things Jesus walked in Galilee... For he would not walk in Jewry, because the Jews sought to kill him. Now the Jews' feast of tabernacles was at hand. And his brethren, you remember his brethren, as we go through this, you'll, if you don't remember it, you'll see it. Again, it'll remind you, they didn't believe in him. I mean, they, they saw him exist. Now, I've never seen Jesus. And I believe in him. I believe he's a Messiah. Amen? His own brothers were looking right at him. Didn't believe he was the Messiah. Okay? So anyway, uh, his brethren therefore said unto him, Depart hence and go into Judea, that thy disciples also may see the works that thou doest. For there is no man that doeth anything in secret, and he himself seeketh to be known openly. If thou do these things, show thyself to the world. Now again, understand this idea that what's happening, especially this is the fourth gospel, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. Now we're fixing, we're just a few years away from the Feast of Pentecost. Holy Ghost is going to come pouring down and God's people are going to start prophesying. The gospel is going to be preached throughout all the world. Then shall the end come. But all through the Old Testament, Jesus is there every page. He's there. He's there in some form, whether he's the high priest or whether he's the lamb or he's the rod or he's the stone or he is the tabernacle or he, he is the lion or he is whatever. He is the, the son of Abraham or he's the son of David or he's the king or whatever form. He, he's the angel of the Lord. He's all of these things. He's the river of life. He, I mean, he is a multitude of things in the Old Testament. But no one ever knew him by who his real identity was, by the name of Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God. That was a mystery, Paul said. That was kept hidden from the foundation of the world, but is now revealed unto his, his servants, the apostles and prophets, Paul said. So it's been revealed now, and Jesus is, we're sort of in that transition stage. Jesus is saying here, it's, it's not, this Feast of Tabernacles is not the one. Okay? Now he is a Jew, and the Bible says he kept the law, so he went to this feast, but he did it secretly. So the Bible, I think, trying to tell you something. Again, I don't date set, I never, well I won't say I never got into it, I did. Right off the bat, 1998 or 1997 as soon as God said let's study prophecy I'm going where's the date at where's the date at and then finally God just said Mike don't quit just you're wasting time so anyway but I believe that Feast of Tabernacles is relevant I believe it's important so um, anyway uh, his brethren therefore said and depart hence and go to Judea uh, that thy disciples also may see the works that thou doest. For there is no man that doeth anything in secret. That's what kind of tripped that memory about. He's, he's still a mystery right now. He's still a partial mystery to the Jews. It hasn't been quite revealed yet. 
He himself seek and be known openly. Verse, uh, if thou do these things, show thyself to the world. Verse 5, for neither did his brethren believe in him. Now in verse 6, then Jesus said unto them in sort of a rebuttal fashion, my time has not yet come. But your time is always ready. Now you ponder that for a second. And let me just say, in case there is anybody listening to this Wednesday night service who is not born again, you're not saved, you're not right with God. You're looking online for things that might pertain to the second coming or the, the apocalypse or the revelation of Jesus Christ, the, the, the um, battle of Armageddon or the end of the world or the coming of the new world order. You're looking into things like that. But you yourself, if you were to search down deep in your heart, you see that you're not saved. You're not born again. Well, here's the good news. I'm going to repeat this, what Jesus said. My time is not yet come, but your time is always ready. Always. All the way. And at every time, right now, your time is ready. Jesus hasn't come yet, nor has he come yet. And I could repeat that infinitely, well, for a while. He's not come yet. He will come. And I believe when he comes, he will do exactly what the Bible says he will do. He will separate the sheep on one side and the goats on the left. He will put the sheep inside the ark, shut the door, leave the goats on the outside. He's going to judge the goats. He's going to save the sheep. Or we can look at it this way. He's going to gather up all the tares and bind them in bundles and cast them into the fire and there shall be weeping of gnashing of teeth. But the wheat shall shine forth like the sun. Amen. And they'll be put in his garner. So that day is coming. Your day to get right with God is today. It is right now. Don't wait. Don't hesitate. Because one of these days, click. Door's going to shut. Jesus is knocking at the door now. He's knocking. He wants in. He wants to sit down and commune with you and have fellowship with you. And I'm telling you, it is sweet to be with Jesus. Somebody say amen. Okay, so verse 7. The world cannot hate you, but me it hateth. So all you Christians out there, don't take it personally. Because guess what? It ain't about you. I've heard some of these guys at prophecy conferences or on prophecy websites or on prophecy videos say, boy, the information I have on the New World Order, it's likely to get me killed. I mean, this, now I've, been, I've had survived three assassination attempts by the New World Order. They've tried to kill me three different times. I've survived all... I hear that stuff and I just want to go, Bleh! or this one. Well, Pastor Mike, man, I, I, I think I've uncovered some things about the New World Order. But I want to tell it to you. Well, go ahead and tell it to me. Not on the phone. They'll hear us. I, and I, I've had that conversation. I said, are, are you afraid? Are you afraid of them? Why are you afraid of them? What can they do to you? Send you to heaven? Amen. Is that what you're afraid of? Are you afraid of going to heaven? World cannot hate you, but me it hateth, because I testify of it that the works thereof are evil. There's a lot of evil in this world. Go ye up unto this feast. I go not yet up. I go not up yet unto this feast, for my time is not yet full come. In other words, the, the bread hasn't risen yet. The dough hasn't risen enough yet. The peaches still are too hard to pick. They're the right color, but I've been peach picking before out at Eckert's, and I've become quite the expert. I know how to touch them without bruising them to tell whether or not you can go ahead and eat it. Because you go out to Eckert's and ride that wagon, they let you eat all you want. Because they know you're going to buy a bushel basket of them when you get 
You're picking them. Okay? And I've never been more sick in my life than that day. I had, Chris, I had four in my hands getting into that wagon. And one in my mouth. And I, my belly was going, Mike. Yeah, and a, and a lady, the lady that was getting us in the wagon was laughing at me. She said, we literally had to pick a guy up and put him in the wagon. He had eaten so many peaches. He, he said it just, they literally had to pick him up. So let, let, me, let me move on, all right? The world cannot hate you, but me it hates because I testify of it that the works thereof are evil. Go ye up into this feast. I go not up yet into this feast, for my time is not yet full come. But it's coming. Watch for, the si watch for the right signs. Get off the stupid internet. Quit watching Fauci and Bill Gates. Listen, neither one of those guys are the Antichrist and the false prophet. Neither one of those guys are in control. Quit watching those guys. Get in your Bible. Then you'll know when the bread dough is risen enough. Then you'll know when the peach is ripe. Amen? So... Um, I've covered the Feast of Tabernacles. I'm not going to do that, but let's look at this very quickly. There were three primary days that every Jewish male, this is what the Ethiopian eunuch was doing in the chariot riding to Jerusalem. He was a, he was a Ethiopian Jew. And I don't know if you remember back in the late 80s, early 90s, somewhere around in there, when there was a mass exodus of Ethiopian Jews, Israel sent, um, what is it, El, El Al? Their, their airline. Yeah, they sent their airline, the Jewish airline, to Ethiopia Anybody who was a Jew in Ethiopia and wanted to come to Israel, free ride. And they helped put them up. And there was a mass exodus of Ethiopian black Jews. And they say, well, were you, how, how did that happen? And the idea was it was Solomon and Bathsheba. Or the queen of, excuse me, queen of Sheba. Is who I'm thinking of. And uh, that, they had, that they had children and spawned an offspring line in Ethiopia. And um, anyway, they, they, went into, they went into Israel back in the early 90s. But anyway, that's what the Ethiopian eunuch was doing on this way because there was three primary feast days that every Jewish male every year had to attend. It was by law. It didn't matter where you lived. It didn't matter what you had going on. When this feast day came, if you were a Jewish man, you, you were in Jerusalem on that day. The first one was the Feast of Trumpets, and that was the first day of the seventh month. The other one was the tenth day of the seventh month was the Day of Atonement. I'm, I'm getting mixed up here. It was, it was the uh, Passover, the Feast of Pentecost, and then the Feast of Tabernacles. The Feast of Trumpets, Day of Atonement, and Tabernacles sort of go in together, okay? So the feast days was the Passover, the Feast of Pentecost, and the Feast of Tabernacles. And the first day of the seventh month was the Feast of Trumpets. And they would blow trumpets, literally. And that's prophetic. That is what you're seeing in the book of Revelation when they blow seven trumpets. It is, it is in relation to the Feast of Trumpets, I believe. Then you had the Day of Atonement. That was the, the one day of the year that the high priest was able to walk into the most holy place with the blood of atonement, sprinkled it seven times on the mercy seat, not eight, not six, not three and a half, seven times exactly on the mercy seat to atone for the sins of Israel for one year only. And the next year had to do it again. The next year had to do it again, had to repeat the process. The Catholic Church is so evil that they upped the ante. They said, we're going to do this thousands of times a day, every day. We're going to kill Jesus every time we speak the Mass. It's wicked. And then they had, then on the 15th day of the seventh month was the Feast of Tabernacles. The seventh month. Why the seventh month? The seventh month is perfection. 
completion. It is finished. It's done. It's over with. Time no longer. Time's up. Okay? Time is up. You, you've had all the time I'm going to give you. You've had time to get saved. Your day has... You, we, I've given you chance after chance after chance. And now it's time to face judgment. And it was also called Sukkot. Because Genesis 33, Jacob journeyed to Sukkoth and built him a house and made booths for his cattle. Therefore, the name of the place is called Sukkoth. And the word Sukkoth means booths. And they uh, used palm branches to make these temporary dwelling places in. And the Jews would, during the Feast of Tabernacles. Tabernacles means God is tabernacling with them. He says, I am dwelling with my people in the temporary house that, that they built. What is the temporary house? It's the one that we've got that John had to go clean up yesterday because I said, you're going to ride up with, with Roy and I? He's, oh, yeah. Maybe I better go home and clean up. Yeah, maybe you should. God will be saying, boy, I'm glad this is temporary. <laughs> Amen. Amen. But that's, and that's what it was. It was a temporary dwelling place for God. Okay, then they would take the booths down. Now, this is, this, if, you go to, if you go to Brooklyn, New York, to the Hasidic Jewish neighborhoods, you'll see these things sticking out. There'll be apartment buildings, and they'll have a little patio deck on every apartment and the Hasidic Jews the conservative practicing Jews will get out their booth stuff and set up a booth and dwell out there on the patio deck during the Feast of Tabernacles they'll set up tables they'll eat they'll fellowship they'll read the Torah out there drink wine Mechayim! okay have a good time out there uh, but that's that's what you'll see if you go to if you go to that area in, in New York City. That's what you'll see during Feast of Tabernacles only. They bring those tabernacles out, and they some and many of them will have beds out there. They take a lot of them take it serious. They'll sleep out there. That's what God said for us to do. What, what are we supposed to do? This is what God said to do. Why are you doing it? We don't know. But this is what God said to do, right? So they're going to do it. They don't they don't understand the true meaning of it. The true meaning of it is Christ. The, the, the tabernacle is Christ. We are dwelling in Him. We're abiding in Him. Amen? So that's what, it, that's what it's really all about. It, 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 and in my mind, it is the unfulfilled feast day. Passover and the meaning of Passover was fulfilled at Passover. It was. It was fulfilled to the day. On Passover, Jesus offering up his body, his blood as the Lamb of God slain from the foundation of the world. The Bible says he is our Passover. So should we celebrate Passover? Can if you want. You can if you want. I wouldn't do it the, the Jew's way. I would not have, what is that called? Uh, Passover... Uh, there's a funny word for it. I can't remember it. The Hebrew Roots people uh, do it. Um, I will say this, and I want you to pray for him. Brady Crumb has gotten off into Hebrew Roots. And I want you to pray for that young man. Because he will practice. It's, it's called a Passover Seder. S-E-D-A-R. And it is... It is about 1% Bible and 99% Babylonian occult traditions that they have piled into this thing. Including children hearing a knock at the door and they run and go check to see if Elijah has come back. And they have an empty chair with a plate with a lamb chop on it for Elijah who's supposed to come back and prepare the way of the Lord. That's not in the Bible anywhere. Yeah, so anyway, but anyway, that's just, yeah, I was never going to mention his name, but you pray for him, all right? But anyway, that, they do not understand the meaning of it. Christ already is our Passover, and he fulfilled Passover at Passover. 
Then, the feast of the end gathering, when the grapes were ready to be brought in, when the peaches and the apples were ripe, when the, when the, when the workers could see the difference between the tares and the wheat. And they went out and bind the tares in bundles, and then they gather in the wheat. That, that's called Pentecost, and it was, they, would, they would number 49 days, 7 times 7 weeks, uh, after the Passover to the day of Pentecost on day 50, boom, that's what Penta means, 5, Pentecost, on the day of Pentecost, the Holy Ghost starts gathering everybody together, amen? And he's still gathering, still gathering together those who are in Christ, Amen? Okay, but Tabernacles has not had a Christ fulfillment. That's what it takes, a Christ fulfillment. He will fulfill it. Now, I'm not going to say that's when the rapture is going to happen because I don't know that. I don't know everything that's in the Bible and how everything's going to line up. I haven't made a chart or a graph of how everything's going to happen. I just believe God's going to fulfill tabernacles at tabernacles the way he did Pentecost at Pentecost and Passover at Passover. Somebody say amen. Revelation 21, 3, And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. And God himself shall be with them, and be their God. Matthew chapter, well, look at this, Christ. He is the tabernacle. His name, now watch this, now all this was done that it might be fulfilled which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet saying, Behold, a virgin, not a, not a young woman. That was the revised version that came out. West Cotton Hort did that to the Bible. A young woman, no, it's a virgin. A virgin shall be with child and shall bring forth a son and they shall call his name Emmanuel. Which means God, which being interpreted is God with us. And notice Chris, from this day, no one ever called him Emmanuel. No one ever did. Even though it was prophesied and then reiterated here that his name was to be called Emmanuel for 33 and a half years while he walked this earth and walked on the water of this earth, no one ever called him Emmanuel. We don't call him Emmanuel now when we say our prayers. We don't say in the name of Emmanuel, Jesus Christ. We don't say that. It's just, I believe it's coming, though. I believe there is a perfect fulfillment in which when he comes, we will call him Emmanuel, meaning God with us. Amen. 2 Corinthians 6, verse 16. What agreement at the temple of God with idols? For you are the temple of the living God, as God has said, I will dwell in them and walk in them. I will dwell in them and walk in them. And I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Notice four things here. One, two, three, four. Boom, 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 boom. Wherefore, for this reason, because God, you wouldn't, hey, if you were walking with God and you walk past the bar and your buddies were in there and they said, Hey, come, get in here. Who's that with you? Well, this is the Lord God Almighty. Hey, bring him in here. You wouldn't walk in that bar with Jesus, would you? No. There's a lot of things you wouldn't do if Jesus was standing there holding your hand. So don't do them. Wherefore, come out from among them and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing. You know, I think that's a prophecy. Underline that in your Bible. Touch not the unclean thing. Because I think that's a prophecy. I think there's something that all of us God's people are going to see on a certain day and we're going to look at it and go, that is the unclean thing. And I'm not touching that. I am not touching that. And I will receive you. That's the condition. It was a condition 
of God's dwelling with you. As long as you don't touch the unclean thing, I will be with you. Okay? Uh, and will be a father unto you, and ye shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. Now, back at the ranch, John chapter 7, verse 10. But when his brethren were gone up, then when he also up unto the feast, not openly, but as it were in secret. See? He, he, and let me ask you this. What is, he, what is he trying to avoid here? In your opinion, what is he trying to avoid? Just take a guess. He's, his brothers are trying to push him to go up to tabernacles, go up to the temple in Jerusalem, jump up on a table and say, I'm the Messiah. Right? That's what they're trying to get him to do. Because they don't believe in him. They, they're mocking him is what they're doing. So what is Jesus? When, when he healed the ten men that, that had leprosy, and he said, see not that you tell anyone, and go thy way. One of them obviously came back and knelt before him. That was a tithe, by the way. Ten percent. But why didn't Jesus want them shouting out all over the neighborhood that he had healed them all ten of leprosy. Why was it that when they went to, to take Jesus, to take him and, oh, he's going to be our king, that he slipped through the crowd like he was a ghost just sliding through, like melted butter? Okay? What, what was he avoiding? Exactly. So, and, he, and he said it already in this chapter. My time is not yet. If you go to Acts chapter 1, look at what the disciples asked him. Um, verse 6, when they therefore were come together, they asked of him, saying, Lord, wilt thou, wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? He said, no, nah, not yet, not time. This is, what he's, this is what he's avoiding. He is, he is letting it be known. This tabernacle's feast is important. You go up. This is what God told you to do. Now go up and do it. And Jesus himself, being obedient to the law, finds himself at the Feast of Tabernacles, but secretly. What he's avoiding is them making him or trying to make him king right then and there. The zealots would have done it. The zealots who hated Roman rule and then the Sanhedrin probably would have went along with it just to maintain their religious power, their behind the scenes power. But Jesus was not about to sit on some throne in Jerusalem with a big crown on his head, ruling over all these Jews, because he, he hadn't become the lamb sacrificed yet. He had to go to the cross first, and you don't nail kings to the cross. He had to go to the... Judas had to betray him. That's why Jesus picked him. He had to be... He had to be whipped. He had to be crowned. He had to be stripped. He had to be scourged. He had to be hung. He had to lie in the grave. And then he had to rise again. Then he had to descend into heaven. Why? So that you and I could have him in this form. That each one of us could have him with us every day and everywhere we go. So he's avoiding right now being set and established as the Emmanuel because he has not done the atonement yet. He's not made an atonement for sins. And that was his whole purpose in the first coming. But in the second coming, he's not going to have the sins of the world laid on him again. Number one, doesn't need to be. Number two, I wouldn't do it again. 
Amen. So, verse 11, Then the Jews sought him at the feast and said, Where is he? And listen, he was standing right there. But did they see him? No. And I want to tell you something. There's, some, there's a lot to be said about how God opens people's eyes or closes people's eyes. There's a lot to be said about that. Things that you will read a year from now in the Bible that you've read a hundred dozen times, now it'll hit you like a two-by-four, and you'll go, Wow! Look at... Woo! Woo! Thank you, Jesus, for this! And somebody's going, what is it? Well, I can't explain it now. But it sure feels good, though. He, he'll open your eyes at the right time. He was standing right there. In fact, he was on the cross and speaking, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani. He was speaking, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? He was quoting Psalm 22. They knew that. But they couldn't understand his speech. God confused them. Let him die. Had they known it was the Messiah, they might have tried to pull him off the cross. We can't have that. So, verse 12, There was much murmuring among the people concerning him, for some said, He is a good man. Others say, Nay, but he deceiveth the people. Howbeit no man spake openly of him for fear of the Jews. Now about the midst of the feast, Jesus went up into the temple. When did he do it? Midst of the feast. It's a seven-day feast. Okay? So three and a half days. How many years is that? It'd be like three and a half years, 42 months, 1,260. The, the Antichrist reigns. Jesus' ministry was three and a half years. There's a, there's a lot to be said of that too. So about the midst of the feast, Jesus went up into the temple and taught. And he's doing this on purpose. I think he's showing us something. And the Jews marveled, saying, How knoweth this man letters, having never learned? In other words, how did he... Back then, you didn't have public school education. You didn't have... If you were an educated person and could read, you are a very high class, high stature of people. And they're just wondering, this man has got... He's an ignorant man, but he knows letters. Is this the first time he's taught in the temple? Mm. he's done this before when he was 12 years old maybe one of those old men maybe like Nicodemus is going I remember a young man 12 year old boy came and taught us and we were marveling then at what he was saying Jesus answered them and said my doctrine is not mine but this that but his that sent me if any man will do his will he shall know of the doctrine, whether it be of God or whether I speak of myself. And let me in strongly encourage everyone in this age where most churches refuse doctrine. They don't like to teach it. They say it's more about an experience. It's more about how you how you how God makes you feel. It's more about experiencing the, the emotion of God, not learning the doctrine of God. Uh, um, Purpose-driven church guy. Rick Warren. Very, very against teaching doctrine as doctrine in his churches. He said, I'd rather do it secretly. I'd rather do it so that they didn't know I was doing it. What's wrong with that? Uh, I may do this tomorrow. The church that I've been looking into, this lady that made her fortune and glory, telling everybody if you're fat, it's because you're, you don't love God. Uh, Gwen Shamblin. And uh, the tragedy of the, the plain... When the Bible says God dashes his enemies in pieces, when they were pulling debris and bodies out of that lake, they were pulling pieces of people out. It literally 
tore that plane into shreds and the people that were in it. But there is a video now that this thing has happened and uh, the church is, is moving forward. They've got him a new pastor and uh, I think it's a guy. And um, now understand this is number one at best a Church of Christ church. Church of Christ is not a salvation church. It is a works church. You must be baptized in their baptistry church. And you cannot, if you are not Church of Christ, you are not going to heaven. Period. You know what I'm saying, don't you, Rose? So number one. Number two, this, this church, it's called the, the Remnant Church. And it's because Gwen Shamblin opened her big Jezebel mouth and said, there is no such thing as the Trinity. That doctrine is wrong. And all these churches got it wrong, and that's when Brentwood cut her off, cut her publishing contract off, and all these churches canceled her programs, and she started losing money, so she got kicked out of the church that she was in for heresy and started her own church. So we have a heretic church, and they make a 7 to 10 minute video about how wonderfully awesome their church is. And they spend time showing you every program they have. And, and it's like, ooh, ah, it's like Disney World for heretics. They show them what all they do with all the kids and how they have all these wonderful things for children and teenagers and how they have these wonderful things for adults and how they have these wonderful things for seniors. And you watch this thing and, oh, yeah, let's go to that church. Pay no mind to what they believe. Because they put on a neat show every Sunday. And that pastor slick talks everybody. And I don't have to deal with my kids during church. I can shovel them off down stairs in a room, probably with some pedophile. I'm telling you, that's how it works. Jesus came to teach doctrine. And he said, my doctrine is not mine. Paul would say the same thing. It's not Paul, I'm Paul an apostle, not called of men, but by Jesus Christ. My doctrine is not mine, but his that sent me. So that matches, if you want to write down, uh, where is it, Hebrews 10? In thy book. Uh, Lo, I come in the volume of the book, it is written of me to do thy will, O God. Where does this doctrine come from? The book. But his that sent me, if any man will do his will, he shall know the doctrine, whether it be of God or whether I speak of myself. How do we know if... A, so if I came in here and said, there is no doctrine of the Trinity in the Bible anywhere. If I came in saying that, could you, could you prove me a liar with your Bible? Absolutely. And say, Pastor, please repent or leave. And if I don't repent, you kick me out. He that's, now watch this. Here's also a clue to the Antichrist. Now, the unclean thing, I think, is related to the Antichrist. And the mark. Verse 18, he that's, he says, um, verse 17, If any man will do his will, he shall know the doctrine, whether it be of God or whether I speak of myself. He that speaketh of himself seeketh his own glory, but he that seeketh his glory that sent him, the same is true, and no unrighteousness is in him. Did not Moses give you the law? And yet none of you keepeth the law. Why go ye about to kill me? Now they later accused him. They heard him say this. They heard him say, if I came in speaking in my own name or speaking of myself, then you know that I am, I'm not the right guy. So you watch out for the guy who comes speaking of himself and in his own name. So later on, they thought they were going to catch him in something. You said, if you come speaking in your own name, well, you're speaking in your own name now. And Jesus said, I'm just being a second witness to what the Father said. But if, watch this now. If, if it was all about Jesus... And glorifying him, why would he have ever consented?
to being stripped naked and hung on a cross all day long. Joe Biden, well, maybe he did do that. Walk around naked. Yeah, he did, didn't he? Secret Service people. Ugh. But it wasn't about Jesus when it was on the cross. It was about us. And it was about honoring the just commandments of his father. It wasn't about him. Well, amen.